I'm excited to be here and talk to you about this. It's always fun to talk about things that I'm really excited about. Um, I'm going to start with a statement, kind of a, a belief, something that really is core of why we do what we do. It's that robots are going to do more when they can go where humans go. Uh, they're going to have a bigger impact, um, do more useful things, okay? And just a little bit of history of robotics, it started out with automation. It started out with basically machine tools like CNC machines, but uh, basic pick and place and position control and move something from this point to that point or follow a particular trajectory bolted down. And if a person gets away in that machine because it's position controlled, it's not too sensitive to forces, the person's gonna get injured. So these robots are behind cages. They have no real perception, they have no generality, they just do a very basic thing. Now, more recently, these uh, cobots, as they're often called, robots that are much more sensitive to how they apply forces in the world, uh, can, be, uh, can have humans be in their space, basically. It's a robot space, it's a, they're bolted down to the table, it's a manufacturing or whatever it is, and humans can be there safely, they don't need to be behind cages. Even more recently, robots have begun to be implemented in looser uh, environments, in systems that are generated. You build an entire warehouse around these robots with the flat floors, with the whole system, for moving in logistics and package, and this is why we get Amazon Prime in, in two days, right? That kind of efficiency with that kind of machine. But um, what I really wanna do is have robots exist in human spaces. The problem, of course, is that human spaces obviously are designed around humans. Um, the best way to access these is gonna be two legs and by manual, two arms, uh, upright posture, being able to reach up, reach out, uh, you know, handle the stair rails and things like that. And, and a lot of these spaces are either very expensive or impossible to, to modify, to design around a robot. It's just not a realistic thing to do. We at Agility Robotics are uniquely good at legged robots. And that is our focus, is this mobility capability, all right? And it started with really an understanding of biomechanics and looking at how animals do this, from turkey to guinea fowl to ghost crabs to ostriches to humans to horses. There's fundamental truths that kind of underlie how does legged locomotion work. We try to translate that into math models, and this is a whole community, biomechanics community, robotics community, looking at this. And then our focus has been translating some of that mathematical understanding, those models, into machines. Um, and this is you know, an early machine, Mabel, uh, then going on to Atrius uh, 1 and 2, these were university research machines, these were not products. Um, now Atrius is important in that that is the first machine, the first machine ever, to reproduce the dynamics of a human walking gait. And when I say that, I mean we walked Atrius over a force plate, we walked a student over a force plate, you get the same measurements. That leads to human-like capabilities. And when I say human capabilities, this robot, of course, doesn't look like a human, it's this four bar linkage. It doesn't have any cameras. So if your arms are folded and you're wrapped in a blanket and someone, so you can't see anything or move your torso and someone says, hey, the ground is flat, I promise. Go ahead, move forward, but it's not, okay? And you're gonna stumble a little bit and take big steps up and down. You can handle quite a lot. Atreus is able to have human-like capabilities in that scenario, get that kind of base robustness. Now, Cassie is the first product, the first thing we've sold. It's more robust, it's able to stand in one place, it's able to steer, it gets that base robustness, doesn't have the perception, but we've sold that to uh, you know, a lot of the top universities. Digit, now with arms and perception, is where we're trying to do something pragmatically useful with this robot. No longer an R&D machine, something that can do things in the world. And we've brought along our prototype Digit V1, and uh, Taylor, maybe you can bring Digit out. So as I said, this is our first prototype, and you can see when it's swinging its arms and moving around, that is all physics driven. None of this is puppeteered. None of that is designed to look in any way realistic. It just ends up being that way in part because of the way physics work, right? Physics apply to animals and robots alike. So if we're getting the physics right, it starts to look more and more realistic. And that's pretty important for us. So Digit's just gonna hang out there. I'll talk a little bit more. Oh, yeah, wave. <laughs> uh, we've started manufacturing our Digit V2s, and our V3s are going to be a product uh, coming uh, first quarter next year. 
And very similar to V1, just more robust, more computing, more bug fixes, that kind of thing. Our plan at this point is to go to market today. You know, you can imagine all kinds of future applications that are going to be really important for this. I, for one, I want robots in my home helping me when I'm, you know, very, very old, or now, really, if we could have it, but at least when I'm old. Uh, but we need to go to market today. We need to do something useful today. And the first thing that we've really identified is this huge array of um, environments where just carrying stuff from one place to another is useful. And there are so many applications for that in semi-controlled environments, like in warehouses, like in uh, general legacy uh, uh, in industry. Uh, environments that have stairs, environments that are not going to be modified for the robots, where the robot that can go where humans go, but do something really simple, just, I don't know, carrying um, photo mask in a clean room from this machine through the room and up the stairs to another machine. That's an application that uh, a company talked with us about. And they're paying very highly paid machine operators who are in a clean room environment quite a bit of money, and they're spending a lot of their time just as gophers, you know, carrying stuff around. So having a robot do that would be a really useful way to leverage the value of, of the human being. I, I really appreciated that from, from earlier talks today. But once you've done a lot of those things, okay, the simple things, and uh, you start to have autonomous vehicles be out and doing, you know, on their own, really capable, well, that's just carrying a package from a vehicle to a doorstep. That's really not much different. It's the same capability. And then we get out to doing mapping and real-time data collection. Um, say, inspect underneath the factory floor. There's uh, another company that talked to us about this. They have a thousand people whose job is just to inspect the pipes and the wires and all the things underneath the factory floor. Um, and people die every year because there's like a CO2 leak under there. So you want robots to do those things, but it's all stairways and railings and it's very hard for robots to get there. So having robots go in human spaces can really solve some of these applications. But all, of the, applic all the features that we're talking about, being able to walk around, being able to pick stuff and move stuff, being able to have perception, when the robot gets a little bit confused, say, um, as it will, uh, you want a human to be able to log into the robot, get the robot unconfused, and then log into the next robot that's confused. And again, leveraging the human capability, but through a whole bunch of these robots as important tools. That will enable telepresence. That enables you to then, if you want in the future, put on your VR goggles, log into um, you know, the robots that are stationed in Japan, and walk around there and see some really interesting sites and just spend an hour doing that. And you have agency. You can go where you want to. You can manipulate the things. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those. So just a view of automation and human spaces. This is a very recent video we took of Digit V2 back in our laboratory, uh, Mikhail presses the pickup box button. So the robot is doing the planning there to pick that up. And then he's steering the robot. So this is kind of a shared autonomy with not a lot of autonomy involved. Um, he's steering the robot like he would a car. Of course, the robot is choosing its foot placements and everything else. Uh, you can imagine if there were stairs, the robot would take care of seeing those stairs, planning it, and dealing with it. And he presses the set box down. And this is an ongoing partnership we have also with a large automation company. It's, it's confidential. I really would love to talk about it, but um, there are union issues. So we really need to not talk about specifically who we're working with on that. Um, and Autonomous Last Mile Delivery. This is an ongoing collaboration with Ford Motor Company. We shot this uh, pseudo commercial with them, uh, with the Ford van. We're going to continue working with them on this as well as... Um, uh, more logistics, more standard basic logistics things like I, like I talked about in, in warehouses. And right now in Tokyo, um, despite the typhoon that just hit, they're still holding SeaTech, which is kind of the Japanese version of uh, CES, Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, one of our robots is there in a partnership with ANA, All Nippon Airlines. And they are sponsoring the Avatar X Prize. And what's really interesting is they don't view themselves as an airline. They've changed it to a company that connects people across distances. And they have this vision of, of this uh, telepresence, um, you know, avatar. Uh, you know, I talked about like the remote, um, remote uh, tourism, um, but also the aging population in Japan and really being able to address that with robots going places. 
so this is in Japan right now. It's up at, a, at that display and kind of showing mapping and environment, things like that. I see this also as useful for security tasks, for inspection tasks, for real-time data collection. Uh, there are so many things where being an avatar is going to be really valuable and important. So there's a few examples. Um, I think the important piece is that this is a platform with a certain set of capabilities, and that kind of platform is fairly versatile, the same way as a person is for doing things in human environments. Um, and that, that's our focus, is machines that can go where people go to make a real difference in our world, in human spaces. Uh, so with that, thank you for your time.